Good morning. Good morning. Welcome guests and members to Trinity for our Sunday worship service. I'm privileged to lead you this morning for the first time. I'm your brand new old pastor, Pastor Glenn Schwanke, your part-time retirement pastor. We worship on a Sunday in the season of Pentecost. It's the time of the church here when we put a little bit more of the focus on the life of a Christian, the life of a believer, our lifelong response to the Lord and all of his gifts of grace. This morning, the readings will really drive home the importance of Christian humility. In the sermon, I'll go in a little different direction and assure you that even though the faces in the front of the sanctuary or the faces in the pews often change, some things never change. We follow the order of worship in the worship folder. We open with our first hymn. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God.
Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent His only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave His life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by His authority, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. and mercy, teach us by your Holy Spirit to follow the example of your Son in true humility, that we may withstand the temptations of the devil and with pure hearts and minds avoid ungodly pride. All through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our readings for this morning emphasize this basic truth for every believer, that we are to be humble. And we recognize how true that must be when we begin to remember everything we are, everything we have, all that is good, is a pure gift from God. Our first reading this morning, our Old Testament reading, is taken from the book of Proverbs, the 25th chapter. We read verses 6 and 7. Do not honor yourself in a king's presence, do not stand in a place reserved for great people because it is better to be told, come up here, than for you to be humiliated before a ruler whom your eyes have seen. The word of the Lord. Be to God. The epistle reading that we have before us this morning is taken from the book of James, the second chapter, beginning there with verse 1 where the inspired author also gives us some very practical ways in which we show this proper humility before God and others. My brothers, 
Have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ without showing favoritism. For example, suppose a man enters your worship assembly wearing gold rings and fine clothing, and a poor man also enters wearing filthy clothing. If you look with favor on the man wearing fine clothing and say, sit here in this good place, but you tell the poor man, stand over there, or sit down here at my feet, have you not made a distinction among yourselves and become judges with evil opinions? Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you dishonored the poor man. Don't the rich oppress you? And don't they drag you into court? Aren't they the ones who blaspheme the noble name that was pronounced over you? However, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show favoritism, you are committing a sin, since you are convicted by this law as transgressors. In fact, whoever keeps the whole law but stumbles in one point has become guilty of breaking all of it. For the one who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law of freedom. For there will be judgment without mercy on the one who has not shown mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand. Our gospel for this morning is taken from the book of Luke, the 14th chapter. We read there verse 1 and then jump ahead to verses 7 through 14. One Sabbath day, when Jesus went into the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat bread, they were watching him closely. When he noticed how they were selecting the places of honor, he told the invited guests a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not recline in the place of honor, or perhaps someone more distinguished than you may have been invited by him. The one who invited both of you may come and tell you, give this man your place. Then you will begin, with shame, to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and recline in the lowest place, so that when the one who invited you comes, he will tell you, friend, move up to a higher place. Then you will have honor in the presence of all who are reclining at the table with you. Yes, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. He also said to the one who had invited him, When you make a dinner or a supper, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors so that perhaps they may also return the favor and pay you back. But when you make a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. Certainly, you will be repaid in the resurrection of the righteous. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated for our next hymn.
bow your heads with me for just a moment of prayer. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you alone are our strength. You alone are our Redeemer. Amen. The Word of God that guides us this morning is a text that comes from the book of Hebrews, the closing chapter, chapter 13, verses 7 through 9. Remember your leaders who spoke the Word of God to you. Carefully consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings, for it is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by foods which are of no help to those who make them a way of life. This is the word of the Lord. Dear friends in Jesus Christ, I'm going to be a little rusty at this this morning. Why? Because the last time I delivered an inaugural sermon, a first sermon in a congregation, was September the 15th, 1996. Now, I'm only a liberal arts major, but I think that means it's been just a couple weeks shy of 26 years. And an awful lot has changed in 26 years. There are probably at least a few people in the congregation this morning that aren't even that old yet. And back in 1996, September... At peace, I got my first email account. The internet was still kind of brand new. The internet, uh, the email account I had was with Juno.com. Anybody remember that? The only way you could log in was with a phone modem on your computer. Anybody remember those, ee, 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 those tones we heard as it logged in? And the speed of the internet back then? Just logging in? You might as well get a cup of coffee, have a donut or two, walk the dog, putter in the garden, come back, and you'd still be waiting for it to log in. September 1996, eBay just began offering online auctions. Think about that. Amazon was only around for two years then, and all they were selling it at that point in time, if I remember correctly, was, was books. That's where they focused first. And I'm not talking about these digital books that you download instantly on your Kindle. These are old-fashioned book books. People actually, for the most part, still went to stores, physically drove over there, went into the building, got their groceries or whatever, put them in a cart, checked out, went home. What a novel concept. 1996. That was the first year, that was the year when Dolly, if I remember correctly, was the first mammal who had been successfully cloned. Mad cow disease was getting quite a bit of the news because it was killing people over in England, although the rest of the news went to Prince Charles and Princess Diana because they were getting divorced. The United Nations signed what I believe was called the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, which was supposed to ban any nation on the face of the planet from conducting nuclear tests, either above ground or below ground, whether for military or civilian purposes. And back in 1996, I was just a little bit more than one year removed from the over-the-hill birthday that's known as 40. My congregation in Fort Wayne made sure I knew that when I celebrated that because they decorated the fellowship hall with black all over the place. In 1996, my wife Terry was still carrying out her consummate culinary magic in the kitchen. That's one reason I have this boyish shape. My daughter was four and a half years old, rambunctious at times, and she responded to my constant teasing by saying, Daddy, I'm not a stinker. The jury's out. My hair back then was still pretty much blonde and, and reddish, especially the beard, instead of what I prefer now to call this silverish tint that I have. 
I could still lift a five-eighths sheet of drywall, the fire retardant stuff, in a 10-foot sheet without any problems. And when I went into my doctor, uh, and she would bring up these lifelong pesty issues I had with hypertension and cholesterol, I said, make sure my notes say, no, 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 I'm not taking any medication. And then a few years back, that same doctor was shocked when I said, yeah, okay. I guess it's, it's time. And so in the last few years, I have started to borrow the Toby Keith song, at least a phrase from it, I ain't as good as I once was. <laughs> and there might be a few others here this morning that would like to join me in a rousing chorus of that song, but let's wait till after church, maybe take it out to the parking lot, or maybe people would prefer if we'd go back in the woods. 26 years. There have been so many changes in our personal lives, in our country, and in our world, changes here too. Change can bring uncertainty. Change can bring worry. Change can bring fear. So it seems to me that this is a pretty good time for me to encourage every last one of us, some things never change. Not our sinfulness, that's the bad news. Not our Savior and not our need for God's grace. It's the writer to the Hebrews who urges us, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you, carefully consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. And I need to admit this to you right away. Whenever I study that particular verse, especially if getting ready to preach or teach a Bible class or engage with God's people, this verse makes me nervous. Remember your leaders who spoke the Word of God to you. All things being equal, I prefer that the people I'm privileged to serve with the good news of Jesus Christ, I prefer that you really didn't remember me. Remember the leaders the writer to the Hebrews is probably first referring to? Sure, those early church leaders, remember them. Remember somebody like Stephen. Book of Acts shows us he's being martyred for the faith. He's being stoned to death. And he's still witnessing to his Savior. And he's praying even for those who are stoning him. Remember Stephen. Remember that guy by the name of the Apostle Paul, the name he carried once he was converted to the faith. Imprisoned twice, shipwrecked, beaten, whipped, stoned, finally martyred for the faith. Remember him. Remember John, the apostle. The only one of the apostles who I always said is a little bit like the Energizer Bunny. He just kept going and going and going. He wasn't martyred for the faith, but in his old age, he didn't get a tar paper shack. Instead, he got exile on the island of Patmos. Remember those individuals. And remember so many other men and women of the faith who endured all, they suffered all, they gave all, and yet they stood firm and they witnessed to their Savior. Remember them. And over the rest of the years, maybe you'll bring to mind somebody like uh, oh, Dr. Martin Luther. Huh? In a later era, especially in the Wisconsin Synod, Missouri Synod, maybe you'd remember a CFW Walter, a Haneke, a, a Peeper. Remember them. But if you insist on remembering me, especially as you get to know me, outside of the obvious, that my skin tone is always going to be red and at times it's just going to get redder, and my messages might seem a little long. We'll work on that. <laughs> it's not going to take you long as you get to know me that you're going to remember a sinner. You're going to know that a sinner is leading this worship service. You're going to know that a sinner is proclaiming this sermon. My sins are all too obvious. Sometimes I, I, I just get a little bit mixed up. I, I might mix up words. I might forget assignments, even though I try my best. I tell you what, I keep the post-it note business alive yet. I've got post-it notes all over the place. You know what the problem is? I lose the post-it notes. <laughs> <sighs> 
you will remember me and know that I'm a sinner. And now here's the hard part. I'm going to turn this around and know, even before I get to know you personally, that every person sitting in this church this morning on those comfy padded pews, anybody who might later on watch the video of the service on a lazy boy at home, every last individual is going to be a sinner. And no, I'm not trying to torpedo my ministry here at Trinity before it even gets started by using this as a bully pulpit to shame you. These are just the facts, right? As a, as a leader in the church, worth even a shake or two of salt, I dare do nothing less, I dare do nothing more than simply share God's Word with you. And the Lord is the one who tells us through St. John, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So what might those sins be? I don't know about you, but for me, all too often, it's upside down, inside out, backwards priorities. I start to focus too much on everyday life. You know that tar paper shack that needs to be uh, finished now. Retirement-ish. To the point where you might even nudge the Lord off to the side a little bit or service for other people. What might our sins be? Forgetfulness. According to the Catechism in the Bible, you know, sins of omission are just as deadly as sins of commission. Worry? Fear? Why don't we admit it? Maybe even anger at times over the changes that have come into our lives that we didn't much like and we most certainly didn't want. Oh, it's still so true. Some things never change, not our sinfulness. And praise God, not our Savior. How many changes have you been through here at uh, Trinity over the course of the years? Getting to know the congregation and your history a little bit. There are some here that will still remember the big change of going through a, having a church in Woodruff and a church in Manaqua, and the two will join and come together here as Trinity. You've got a school. Over the years, there have been building projects, uh, the beautiful gathering area, the office area that was done not that many years ago, changing the chancel area, opening it up a little bit, and making it brighter. These are all big changes. People in the community are going to notice this. And there have also been changes in the people, in the staff, in the school. As far as the teachers are concerned, a new teacher joining the staff just this year. And pastors? Yeah, there have been changes there too. And changes also in the members. I wonder how many of you have lost a number of good, close friends here at Trinity over the years because the Lord took them home to heaven. It was Pastor Luchterhand, the younger, who told me just a few weeks ago that since he's been here, it's what, about five years? He's been privileged to perform 43 funerals. And the world around us. Oh, oh boy, that's changed too, hasn't it? Some might say it's just gone crazy. Used to be that people in a lot of communities and places didn't have to lock their doors. Now a secure lock often isn't enough. Everybody's got their security system with the multiple cameras all over the yard and covering every door. Are those called ring systems? And maybe that's not even enough, depending on where you live. Maybe you hire a security firm to also patrol the neighborhood, and still people are going to bed at night terrified. And what about our lives as Christians? How are we supposed to handle what's being called the cancel culture? That really is not very happy with a lot of the positions that we have about the way the Lord guides us according to His commandments to live in this world, especially when it comes right now, it seems to me, around genity, gen gender identity, rather, gender issues. And in back of that is this basic idea that there are no absolute truths anymore. Truth is whatever I think Truth is whatever I feel. And I didn't even mention yet the spiraling inflation that we're supposed to be handling right now. At least the price of gas has cooled off a little bit, but I just read, unfortunately, that they had a fire at a refinery in Indiana. So prepare your wallets. And as I get all those materials I need for my tar paper shack, I always make sure that I'm sitting down when I pay the bill. 
I don't want to be standing lest I faint dead away and fall and hit my head on the ground and the next thing you know I wake up in an emergency room. How are we supposed to handle all of this? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. He gives us forgiveness. He gives us peace. He gives us hope because He's washed us clean in His blood. He gives us confidence for the future. So know this, know this. The unbelieving scientist, with all of his vast knowledge, and all of that alphabet soup after his name, you know, one degree after another, that scientist who might be leading our students in college on secular campuses right now, that individual's never going to be able to bulldoze Jesus Christ and his cross into irrelevance. Because, you see, that scientist looks at our universe starting from the wrong perspective. Book of Proverbs. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. So everything that he observes is going to be colored by that. There's no truth there. There's no hope there. There's no future there. And know this. Even a world gone mad, as one, aiding and abetting the devil and all of his legions, even all of that evil masked as one can never, never topple our Lord God from his throne. In case you ever worry or wonder about that, just read Psalm 2 again. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. This is what we know by faith. So now tell me this. Why in the world do we still worry so much at times? Or is that only me? Especially maybe during the big changes in life. Why do we worry? When we have Jesus Christ, always the same, always by our side, the chosen one of God, the promised one of God, God's Word made flesh, John the Gospel writer can tell us. And that Son of God once said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then he shared this guarantee that is still bedrock solid to this day. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to be with me so that you may also be where I am. What more could we possibly want? Mm. Well, maybe because of upside down and backwards and inside out priorities, sometimes that list can get pretty long. So I ought to rephrase the question. What more do we need? Some things never change. Not our sinfulness, not our Savior, and not our need for God's grace. So as I begin my ministry here, I can't think of any better words to share with you than the inspired words of the uh, writer to the Hebrews who said, do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. We'll pause there just for a second. Oh, man, they're coming out of the woodwork in, in modern America, aren't they? From, from every side. But guess what? That was also the case for Christians in the first century trying to live in the Greek-Roman Empire. Here's the encouragement the writer gives us. For it is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace. Every last one of us. It's good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace. To face what lies ahead of us. The joys, the heartaches, the mountains, the valleys, the death of a spouse, the death of a parent, the death of a child, a new job, a new child, retirement-ish, a tar paper shack. No matter what, you and I share this constant need to be strengthened by grace. But how's that going to happen? I did an extensive Google search this past week on that very point. How are you going to be strengthened by grace? 18.6 seconds-ish. I don't know that you can schedule grace to be delivered to you personally either by Amazon or Grubhub or any other service on a weekly or monthly basis. The way we're strengthened by grace is the way the Lord God planned from eternity. And that is 
through his word and in his sacraments. And so now before God, I just urge you, keep reading your Bibles. Don't set them aside for a while so that the, the one that's on the shelf gets covered by dust or the one that's on your phone, all of a sudden you get that notice, you can go ahead and delete the apps you haven't used for the last 30 days. Don't let that happen with your Bible. I urge you before God, continue in your personal devotional life. Spend some time there on a, on a regular basis. And you know what? Our Wisconsin Synod will help you do that either with, by email, if you want. You can get devotions in your email box every day. Earlier in the morning, it's usually in the dead of night. They'll also send you another email, if you want, through my Bible in three years, where you get your Bible reading, or you can listen to it in audio version. I urge you before God. Continue also with family devotions. And for that there, Wisconsin Synod, we've got so many resources for that. And that would include the meditations and the forward in Christ that are available here through Trinity. Don't let those things just end up in the recycle bin. And I urge you before God, continue to worship regularly and joyfully. Come for the heart and core of every worship service, and that's always going to be the Word of God. Come for the prayers. Come for the hymns. Come for the sermon. Come to be encouraged by one another. Come to encourage one another. Come to give thanks and praise to the one who has given us everything because this is a truth that will never change. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And to drive home that point, let's see. Can you give me 2.8 minutes yet? A story. Older people tend to tell stories. This story is from my ministry. It's way over 30 years ago. I was privileged to serve a man by the name of Herman Ellerding, a retired farmer when I first met him. At the end of his life, he went into a nursing home. Back then, we would talk about dementia. Nowadays, I suppose you'd talk about Alzheimer's. So many of you have walked through that path with loved ones, and you know how it goes at the end. Uh, Herman could remember what happened 80 years ago, as plain as day, but he didn't know what was going on right then, and he didn't know who I was. He mixed me up in every visit with the pastor who had confirmed him. Now, Herman's family had made sure that his baptismal certificate and his confirmation certificate were up on the wall of his nursing home. And some of you who are older, you know that those were big, elaborate documents way back in the day, under glass. So I checked Herman's confirmation certificate. He was confirmed in 1912. I'm old, I'll give you that. But I wasn't even born until more than 50 years later. And yet, you know what? It didn't bother me one bit that Herman thought I was the pastor who confirmed him. Because that just proves some things never change. Uh, Herman Ellerding, maybe with a name like that, you might guess he was a little bit German. So I made sure our devotions were auf Deutsch. And as much as he would struggle with the Lord's Prayer, Unser Vater, der du bist im Himmel, Geheiliget werde dein Name, dein Reich komme. By then, he's saying it with me. The readings, he had them memorized. The creed, memorized. Some things never change. He was still being strengthened by God's grace up to the very end. And when at last he closed his eyes in the sleep of death, Jesus our Savior wrapped him safe in his arms through eternity itself. What a blessing! that some things never change. The length of my sermons, I'll tell you what, we'll work on that. The fact that I'm either going to be red when you see me or redder, that's just a fact. I don't know that I can change that. That's genetics. The Norwegian in me, when it sees that bright, shiny thing in the, sun, in the sky, all I do is burn and peel, burn and peel. I sweat when it's snowing outside. So I'm going to sweat every time I preach. 
I get tongue-twisted. It's especially something that happens in worship services that are in the evening. And this provided lots of amusement for my wife because she'd keep track. And she'd tell me after the service, one of her favorites was the word that I made up, meamble. Uh, announcements after the service. I asked the choir to meamble over to the clavinova for practice. Meamble, in case you're wondering. That's meander and amble smooshed together as one word. I kind of like it. I will cry when I preach. I hope that doesn't put you off. I will laugh at times, and I'm not meaning to, ever to be flippant. But I pray at the end of the day, none of that makes a, one lick of a bit of difference as long as the heart and core of every worship service here and the heart and core of every message delivered here revolves around this unchanging truth, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God that passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ, our unchanging Lord, our precious Savior. Amen. We have a privilege now to stand together as a family of believers and make a confession of our faith. We use the words of the Apostles' Creed as printed in the worship folder. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We continue our worship with the responsive prayer of the church as printed in your worship folder. I did receive one special prayer request that kind of ties in with the announcements at the back. This special prayer request is for one of the couples that was mentioned uh, celebrating an anniversary. Alan Shirley Zeinert, 68th wedding anniversary today, August the 28th. And when I visited them the other day, they smiled and said, and they told us it wouldn't last. We'll remember them in our prayers as well as all of those who have been blessed with finding that special person with whom to spend your life. We bow our heads. Almighty God and Father, we thank you for all your mercies, especially for the gift of your Son, through whom you have revealed your gracious will. We praise you for the Holy Spirit and his working through the means of grace. Strengthen and defend your church, that by your word and sacraments faith may grow and love toward all may increase. Keep our children in the grace of their baptisms. Enable their parents to train them in lives of faith. Preserve our nation in justice and honor. Guide and bless all who make, administer, and judge our laws. Give them wisdom that they may promote justice and hinder evil. Let your blessing rest on planting and harvest, commerce and industry, medicine and science, the arts and culture. Protect all who travel and care for those whose work is difficult or dangerous. Be with all who Comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. Remember those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those for whom death draws near. Grant them your love and take them into your tender care. Father in heaven, this morning we also raise a special petition of thanks and praise to your throne on behalf of Alan Shirley. 
We praise you that you have blessed them through all the years, all the ups and downs, all the challenges and blessings, and you have given them a love for each other that continues to grow deeper and deeper. As we remember them, we also think of all of those individuals blessed to be married, to have that special individual in their life, and all the blessings that we know also through family. We bring them before your throne, also asking that you would continue to guard and keep them, as we ask that you guard and keep all of us, sending your holy angels each day and having Jesus walk beside us every step of the way. And hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. We remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you, who now rest from their labors. Console those who are mourning or living with sadness. Keep us in the truth. Grant us these things, Father, for the sake of Jesus, who died and rose again. Amen. And now we'll have our musical interlude. During that time, we ask that you would kindly sign those friendship registers that are in your pew. And then immediately after that musical interlude, we'll go into the next hymn. stand. We continue with our prayers and blessing. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. 
Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Please be seated for our closing hymn. Once again, good morning. Thank you for the privilege of allowing me to lead you in worship this morning. I pray the Lord richly blesses our time together here at Trinity as we move forward under the banner of the Lamb, proclaiming that unchanging message, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Pastor Luchterhand had one announcement for me. I'm going to be bold enough and add one. He didn't ask for prayers. He's done that before. He didn't officially ask me to ask you for prayers as he deliberates his divine calls. Now, the two of them that he has, please keep him and his family in your prayers each day. Uh, recognize that he's working through this process. Always under, with, the, with this is the goal. Where can I best use my God-given abilities to the glory of the Lord? So that's the additional announcement. And then, you know what, I just thought of something. It's almost like the Bible. There's another additional announcement. I believe there will be fellowship with snacks after the service. But what I was supposed to announce is that now we'll have the Wells Connection. I'll greet you in the back.
Hello, I'm Wells President Mark Schrader. The shortage of pastors in our synod is an ongoing challenge, made even more difficult by the large number of pastors from the baby boomer era who are now reaching retirement age. But that just means we need to work a little harder to ensure that every potential pastor has the opportunity to prepare for that calling. Carl DeMars was a circuit court judge for 20 years, an experience that taught him a lot about human nature. Nothing comes to court if it's good. We really saw the darkest, saddest sides of the things that can happen in human life. While he certainly served God during his time on the bench, Judge DeMars longed for the opportunity to work in full-time ministry. So, in his late 40s, he looked to exchange his black robe for a white one as he began studying to become a pastor. First and foremost is that opportunity to be in the Word of God so much of the time and to be in it with that practical goal of being able to share it with others in the future. After two years at Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary, Carl DeMaris is now in his vicar year, getting practical experience at Living Water Lutheran Church in Oshkosh. There's lots to learn, and nothing replaces the day-to-day -day lessons of gospel ministry. I hope people realize this is joyful work. To share the good news of our salvation in Jesus is joyful work, because your job is sharing glad tidings of great joy. But here's the question I was going to ask you. There's a new effort at Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary to welcome second career pastors with special guidance to help them navigate the process. If you got the fire in your belly, we want you in this program. Our church body wants to make sure we get every single person we possibly can that wants to be a pastor in our church body. Uh, we want every single one. Men who become pastors later in life get the same rigorous preparation as traditional students, including a year as a vicar, learning from a supervising pastor. And then Thursday, you're up, you're up. The result is a seminary graduate who knows the biblical message of Christ well and has the added bonus of life experience. And I think too, just relating to the people, he's had the life experiences and he's able to bring that shepherd's heart to the members. And so he's taking again that calmness, that understanding, that listening that he's done from the bench, and now he can add the, the good news of the gospel on top of that. It's, it's just really rich. Of course, you don't need to be a pastor to share God's good news. Nearly all of Jesus' disciples were essentially second career pastors. Our Lord can call anyone, a fisherman, a tax collector, or a lawyer. Jesus is working in our hearts too, nourishing our faith through his word and strengthening it, preparing us for whatever he has ahead for us. Under a new program at Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary, non-traditional pastoral candidates can take some pre-seminary courses in advance of their studies on campus. So men who are winding down a secular career can get a head start on their pastoral training. For more information, contact Professor Alan Sorum at Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary.